Welcome to Keith and I Don't Tread on Anyone. Today, I'll be having a discussion with Joshua Smith. He is a veteran, blue-collar, working-class family man who has spent more than a decade fighting for the liberty movement. He was three times elected to the Libertarian National Committee, once with the endorsement of Ron Paul, and he's the host of Break, Break the Cycle podcast. Also joining me is Dr. Michael Rechtenwald. He is the author of 12 books, including Google Archipelago, The Digital Gulag and the Simulation of Freedom. He's a speaker and writer for the Mises Institute, and he is a cancel culture target, former professor at New York University. Gentlemen, I really appreciate you coming on to discuss the uh, methods of how you're going to communicate the ideas of freedom if we get the potential to be on the stage in the presidential debates. Starting with Mr. Smith, can you give me an example of a law that you oppose on economic and moral grounds? Two minutes. Sure. Uh, well, I, I mean, we could point to a number of laws, right? I mean, all pretty much all economic law at this point is morally repugnant. Um, they use this to continually break us down uh, through taxation and inflation. And, uh, you know, the charter for the Federal Reserve should have never been enacted. The 16th Amendment uh, is, is wildly uh, immoral, uh, collecting taxes from people and using them to constantly fight uh, never any wars around the world, uh, absolutely immoral. And economically, it is not helpful to uh, the, pe the people of America. So, um, you know, I, I, if I had to, it would be the Tax Act probably uh, is probably the one that I would I would say the most uh, uh, immoral and, and for economic reasons, it's a terrible law. Um, and the IRS must be abolished and we, we must do away with uh, with income tax. It's so thanks. That's that short enough. Is that short enough for you? You got seventy more seconds if you oh, got uh, anything well, else. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, it's it's pretty much to me. It's all all economic laws are are immoral to me. Uh, I think that forcing Americans to pay for, uh, you know, pet projects of the the ruling elite class uh, is immoral and economically not sound. It's not helpful. It doesn't help Americans at all, and it's got to be ended. So, Doctor Rechtenwald, give me an example of a law you oppose on moral and economic grounds. That's a great question. So. I think uh, the most egregious law uh, is the legal tender law. It's both immoral and economically disastrous. Legal tender law gives monopoly power over the uh, the power to print money by the Federal Reserve. So it's a it's a monopoly uh, situation. It can't. And then when they print this excess money, they deflate the dollar, and uh, they uh, likewise introduce uh, inflation. And uh, if they get a chance to institute the CBDC, the Central Bank Digital Currency, they'll be able to do this with the stroke of a key instead of uh, a, you know, whatever it takes to get the presses to roll. So we're looking at a, uh, a, a, a legal tender law which monopolizes money and banking and causes inflation. Uh, it's, just, you know, and this money is usually distributed, at least the first parts of it and the lion's share, to the favored partners of the banks and the Fed. And the so the answer to this is privatized competitive banking and currencies. We need a competitive banking and currency uh, marketplace so that uh, we can have parallel currencies like Bitcoin, like people that like gold and uh, use it for like monetary metals. You draw from it and are able to spend uh, based off of a sum, uh, a holding of gold, and, and other possibilities. I mean, really, it's up to the network uh, of producers and consumers whether they'll accept your currency, but we need, to, we need parallel currencies and privatized banking, private competitive banking and currencies. Mr. Smith, why are some countries wealthy and others impoverished? Uh, it depends on the the uh, immoral actions of the government. Truly, I mean, um, you know, uh, I look at it this way: in, in America, I, I'm an American first candidate. I'm running to represent Americans. I'm running to represent the the people here that the ruling elite obviously hate with a passion. Um, and and uh, you know, I think that most countries that are uh, you know rich or wealthy or well off. Um, probably are, don't have as a moral government as as some of the ones that are less wealthy and destitute 
like you know we're, we're constantly talking about china and the news and the news media currently um and and how you know powerful they can be and how much they could they want to improve their their position over america and this and that but the truth of the matter is there's hundreds of millions of people in poverty in china right now their entire economy is a house of cards it's totally able to fall at any point um and america's not much different at, at the end of the day when you really think about it um but i i just think that it really comes down to the the uh morality of whatever ruling class is ruling over those countries everyone's got a different economy so um but you know i i'm more concerned with america mr rechtenwald why are some countries wealthy and others impoverished i think that's a very uh, easy answer to uh, question to answer and it comes down to the degree to which they have a free market so the free market increases uh, p uh, productivity, unle unleashing uh, uh, a tremendous power of uh, production and uh, capital accumulation is necessary for, uh, for the productive processes uh, to accelerate and to extend, have to be extended uh, pro production processes, which brings down prices and delivers more and better goods to consumers. So. Uh, this actually ends up ra raising wages relative to uh, to goods. So I think that the the answer is simply the degree to which a, a private uh, a market, a free and un unimpeded marketplace, uh, is is uh, is established, and that means, of course, uh, the lesser governmental intervention. Uh, that that is in play, the better the, the economy will be. So government intervention in the economy, although these people that, um, you know, are, are for social welfare and uh, other measures, they actually increase the very uh, problems that they claim to be addressing, uh, to mitigating, like uh, homelessness, like poverty, like mental illness, you name it, whatever they target with their money, it, it makes it worse. So this is really the uh, the upshot. It's really private enterprise and uh, you know a capitalist system, really as capitalist as possible. Mr. Smith, uh, after the twenty year war on terror came to a close after uh, the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, what are the main lessons we could learn as Americans from the war on terror, and uh, what are some of the insights we can use when uh, the elites try to get us into a potential conflict in the future? Well, sure. I, first of all, I think we need, I do think that we need somebody at the federal level that's willing to stand up and say no more uh, authorized use of military force action. We absolutely cannot go to any more war around the world at all without a federal constitutionally declared act of war. Um, and that's a stroke of a pen from a president. It's very easy to end the AUMF. Uh, it's unconstitutional and wildly illegal anyways. But what we've learned is that war doesn't make much sense for the United States population, right? And and at the end of the day, the, the biggest problem is, and, and I'll keep saying this over and over and over again, uh, there's two classes in this country, no doubt. There's the ruling elite class and the rest of us. And they get to say they're they're going to they're gonna continue to do the things that they want to do with your money the, as long as we allow those things to happen. And you know, one of their biggest prep, pet projects is exporting war all over the all over the world. And um, you know, we we've learned that it doesn't help our economy. It, it, it maybe it drives some military industrial complex contractors. It doesn't help the the middle class dad who's trying to raise his family. They continue to uh, inflate our money, as the doctor said. Um, and they're doing this to prop up a military industrial complex, to prop up these constant wars around the world. Um, and it's it's got to stop. It absolutely has to stop. I don't know that, you know, we, we could talk all day about whether the libertarian is going to get elected to the presidency, whether we'll ever have a, a libertarian federal government. I think that's a wild thing to even imagine. Um, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think at the end of the day, it's going to take a lot of people uh, standing up and nullifying all of the federal government's bull. Uh, around the world, around the country, uh, you're going to have to go in and take your local guns and your municipalities and your counties and your states and start telling the federal government we will no longer go along with uh, with your, your your dictates. And I think that an important part of that is the defend the guard legislation legislation that gives us the opportunity to tell the the federal government that we're we won't send the state's national guard to war without a federal declaration of war. So um, I think we've learned a lot. I think that we've learned that the you know the, the ten seconds. Sorry, I think we've learned that the, the federal government is lying to us and getting us involved in these. And I think more people are waking up to it every single day.
Mr. Rechtenwald, what is the lesson we can learn from the war on terror? Well, the war on terror teaches us that, you know, uh, the regime basically uh, premises its actions on a tissue of lies. Uh, we saw this with reference to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the war in Iraq, uh, the Afghanistan war. Uh, we thought we were, you know, we were told, I never thought, but we were told uh, that we were, you know, going after uh, the perpetrators of 9-11 while bombing Iraq. And I protested that war. Uh, way back when, all, all, way, all the way back to February of 2001, before it effectively started. So um, what we've learned is that the war on terror, while supported by some people on, on the right, for example, has actually turned into a weapon being used against them. So it was first meant to supposedly uh, be a war on uh you know, terrorists, uh, you know, external enemies to the state and so on and so forth. Now it's actually being used on domestic terrorists, so-called. So this is actually what's uh, enabled the state to uh, to torture and terrorize and, and uh, to hound citizens. And in the case of the J6 protesters, for example, regardless of what you think about their uh, politics and who they supported and all that, that's not the issue here. The issue is the extent to which this state has turned totalitarian and is willing to put political enemies in prison for 15, 17 years. What we've learned from this war on terror is that they'll turn the same weapons that they claim to be pointing at others at the domestic population. And this is really what we must fight. We're fighting against the CIA, the FBI, the, the intel, all the intelligence agencies. In fact, they're all weaponized against citizens. They're all turned against their guns turned against us. So that, that's what we're up against, and that's what we need to fight, and I uh, have a plan for doing so. I am going to switch up the order here. Mr. Rechtenwald, what do Americans need to know in order to avoid a potential uh, third world war with Russia and China? Oh, that's a great question. Let me think a second here. So I, I would say, first of all, they need to know the history. Um, and so their support that they're throwing, some of these people throwing behind it, I think is extremely misplaced. First of all, the um, the U.S. Uh, actually backed the CIA, uh, used, used the CIA and its State Department as well to assist in a 2014 coup to replace the uh, Russian, the neutral Russian neutral elected president of Ukraine and replace him with an anti-Russian puppet in 2014. Then the, the Ukraine regime bombed its own people in the Donbass region. I mean, they bombed their own people. Uh, and then they violated the Minsk Accords or agreements that were set up in order to create a peace between the, the, the uh, militias in the Donbass region and, and the Ukraine uh, mil military itself. Uh, so Ukraine broke all those promises. Then uh, new NATO partners were lined up on uh, the border uh, of Russia, uh, continually piling more and more on the border of Russia. So threatening Russia and also possibly putting uh, weapons on the border as well. Then there's the escalation of the conflict by the U.S. First of all, we interrupted the peace uh, negotiations early on, would not let them come to the table and negotiate a peace. Secondly, we've escalated the conflict by sending arms and funds, and I think also lending military intelligence to uh, the Ukraine. This is given. This is emboldened Zelensky, to continue this war at all costs, including the costs of hundreds of thousands of uh, his, his own citizens, five million, five to six million refugees from the country, eight million within it, uh, and destroying the entire infrastructure and property basis of that country, uh, as, as well as murder, you know, having many people um, uh, fed into the maw of death. This is just an outrage. The U.S. is behind it. We need to stop it. Once we withdraw all that, they will have no choice but to negotiate. Mr. Smith, what do the American people need to know about avoiding a potential third world war with Russia and China? You have two minutes and 10 seconds. Sure. I don't think that the history matters to the American public, honestly. Uh, you know, people are going to take sure. their sides. They're that's what they're going to do. And we, we're seeing it with all these people with the blockbuster flags and their profiles all over Twitter. They don't care about the history. Uh, the history that I care about and what I've been asked several times uh, in my debates is with Russia and China, you know, uh, 
how do we not honor this trilateral agreement that was signed by Bill Clinton in 1993? I think that's what the, a lot of people bring up to say that we have this obligation to help uh, to help and protect Ukraine. But my argument is always, you know, the federal government also signed the charter for the Federal Reserve. Should we not rip that up? I don't care what the American regime and, and ruling elite that hate me have signed with any other country around the world. The American people have not signed any agreements. We're tired of the constant wars around the world, and it's got to be over. And that includes Ukraine. I mean, we're sending cluster munitions and money, and we're keeping this thing engaged when really we should just be worried about our own people. We should end militaries, uh, bases around the world. We should bring our troops home. We're a much safer na nation with our troops at home. Moving on to China. Uh, this is a tripwire, and and we I've talked about this a lot. Taiwan is a tripwire for war with China. I I personally worked at a plant that makes the robots here in America that create semiconductors. We ship them overseas, and then they make the semiconductors overseas. We have cobalt here, we have silica here. We can mine these things. We can create our own semiconductors. There's already it's already like twelve percent of the semiconductors in the world are made in America. We have companies like AMD in Austin, Texas that can absolutely take these things on and make these things. There's no reason for us to continue to fight and and, and tell uh, uh, China that we're willing to protect their rogue province uh, for over microchip, over chips. This is a complete tripwire. Uh, it's, it's, it's only being done to help try and prop up the, the, the military industrial complex. Every war game that's been ran off the coast of Taiwan, we've lost a carrier thousands of people dead it's it's it, it will cause world war three if we start pushing china and russia as a, as american military force so it's got to be ended right away mr rechtenwald what do the american people need to know about uh, covid lockdowns uh that's a great question and uh you know i think history is a very good predictor of future behavior and uh, that's why i think it's necessary for people to know what history has been so that they can predict and and anticipate what their government's going to do to them next so what we learned from covid in fact was that this government will go to any lengths to uh to lock us down to try to uh create a uh, emergency situations in which they take greater and greater control over our lives. Uh, they uh, effectively, uh, uh, they created a, uh, a cartel system with uh, Big Pharma who colluded to uh, track and trace us and uh, vaccinate us against people, trying to vaccinate people against their wills at the cost of their employment or, or their, or their uh, social standing. Uh, so we learned that uh, there was massive collusion between big tech and various departments of the state, and they uh, colluded to censor us and to disseminate nonstop propaganda. We learned that the government was willing to uh, participate in the largest transfer of wealth from the bottom to the top in the history, in the human history, in all of human history. We've learned that this state would lie about everything, including the, the efficacy of vaccines, the efficacy of masks, the efficacy of social distancing, and worst of all, probably in, in terms of the economic uh, order, the efficacy of lockdowns, which ruined our economy, destroyed millions of businesses, ruined millions of lives, and had absolutely no efficacy, and there was no science to back it. So what we've seconds. learned is the extent to which this state will go to control, lie to, propagandize at, and uh, and destroy our way of life. Mr. Smith, what do the American people need to know about lockdowns? Well, I think I think we learned a lot through the the COVID era, but it's not anything we didn't already know. We know that the ruling elite hates us, wants us fat, sick, and nearly dead. It's very, very important to them that they have the control over our lives. But what it boils down to is the federal government has a much higher time preference than than most of the American public. Um, they're willing to take this investment and lie to your face for years and years and years to get you to continue to to be broke and and sick and destitute. Um, we've learned this lesson repeatedly. Not just about it's not just about the 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 COVID and and pandemics. We've learned it about war. We've learned it you know from all kinds of declassified papers from the federal government over the years. We know they're willing to lie to us. They've lied us into every war we've been into in my lifetime. They've lied to us about 
uh, false flags. And, and now they're just lying to us the same way to, to keep us in our homes, to transfer the wealth, to, to uh, continue to print money. You know, that was another big one. Here's your 1600 bucks. You know, the, the, the ruling class, they, they have a, um, a giant counterfeiting machine is what I like to say. Uh, and they use that to rob us. Um, and this is just another smoke screen so they can continue to rob us and, uh, and continue to, to insert control. We learned this with the Patriot Act, um, all the DAAs, the authorization to use of military force. It's all predicated on lies. And they know that the American public doesn't have the time preference for that. It's all, it's all low. And, um, you know, so they can continue to get us to make bad investments in our health, uh, in our wealth, uh, in our family lives. Um, and, uh, the American public needs to know that. And that's what this, this campaign is about is about, you know, we're not going to be a libertarian president. It's not coming in 2024. Anyone who's saying that is, is got some serious issues. Um, this is a 50 state media tour to try and wake up as many people as we possibly can to the, to the ruling elite hating us and wanting us dead. So. Mr. Rechtenwald, in the 1950s, there were 5% of professions which required an occupational license. In mm -hmm. 2021, there are 22% of occupations which require a license from either state or federal governments. What do Americans need to know about occupational licensing and economic regulation in general? Well, this is a means of trying to monopolize different uh, fields and to control them and regulate them to death so that the state has complete power over those uh, various uh, diverse and uh, uh, divergent fields. So it's, it's another way that the state, you know, attempts to control, uh, get uh, fees and get uh, and regulate and likewise get um, uh, more uh, uh, money flowing towards various uh, enterprises and constricting these business practices uh, and controlling the, um, the labor within them. And I think it's really a, a, a great uh, disservice to the free market. It's, it's, an, it's an impediment to free market enterprise. Uh, we need to allow people to, to seek whatever, uh, you know, whatever uh, cure or whatever uh, uh, legal representation that they that they like, and the state is certainly no guarantor of quality by any stretch of the imagination, given its track record and behaviors. So we're actually entrusting in the state a kind of uh, licensure uh, a, as a guarantor, a warrant uh, uh, on on various practices which they have no business regulating whatsoever. So they are they're creating um, limited monopolies this way. They also do this with patents, and Big Pharma is the great beneficiary of this, uh, and they do it with other uh, other industries as well. It, and, and with the uh, big tech, they do it with the FCC. I mean, they regulate everything. They want to have control of it all. It gets them more money into their coffers. Plus, it creates limited monopolies in some cases, uh, you know, complete monopoly. So this is a very uh, terrible Thanks. practice. We need to leave it to consumers uh, to be educated enough to know what they need. Thank you. Mr. Smith, what do Americans need to know about economic regulation in general? Economic? Are we, I thought we were talking about uh, uh, professional licensing. Are we occupational license? Occupational, yes. occupational licensing and economic regulation. And economic what do regulation. Americans need to know about this? Sure. Yes. Well, look here. This, this is going to tell you everything you need to know. Like. I think it's like 18 of those licenses that you uh, put in that 20 something licensing category are middle class professions. Okay. The, the federal government, uh, the more control they have, the harder it is for the peons to revolt. That's really what it comes down to. They want your, they want to control your profession. They want to control your assets. They want to control everything they possibly can because it makes it easier for them to have the power and the more power they have, the harder it is for us to rise up and tell people about how we can nullify all this stuff at the state and local level anyways. Um, and so it's, you know, th these economic regulations are put into place to like, like the great doctor said here that, you know, it continues to put money in their coffers, but it also gives them a level of control over millions and millions and millions of people who work in these professions every single day that they hate, by the way, they absolutely can't stand these people, but they help them, you know, they're tax cattle at the end of the day that we're all tax cattle to them. And so, um, they have to have control of that to keep control of, of the, the narrative. Um, and that includes jobs. So let me ask you something at the end of the day, would you, would you go to a surgeon who hadn't gone to school for a major life saving surgery? Probably not, but you would go see 
uh, you know, your mechanic friend down the street that doesn't have a mechanics license, but the government doesn't want you to do that because they're not getting a cut when you're working inside somebody else's garage and you're not, uh, you're not, you're not telling them what money you've made and you're not paying your taxes on those mm -hmm. things. So it's all about regular, it's all about the money that they make and the absolute control over the, the lives of the middle class, especially. So thank you. Next question is about social justice. I'm generally defining social justice as uh, the attempt to analyze wealth and privileges within a society based on different groups. The assumption being all disparities between groups are the result of discrimination, and this justifies state intervention. Mr. Smith, what do people need to know about social justice, feminism, and Black Lives Matter? Well, I think it's all a it's all another smokescreen to try and control, right? And and you know the the left constantly talks about class consciousness, and 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 they're they're right. We do need to have some kind of class consciousness, right? Like it's a, it's important because there are a class. There is like a class analysis here, but they are just their class analysis is wrong. The classes are the ruling elite that hate us and want us dead, or they want full control of us and the rest of us. It's not the 1%. It's not the white Christian straight man with kids there. You know, most people don't wake up in the morning and go, you know what? I want to go outside and oppress gay people. And I want to go out and oppress black people. You know, this, this whole social justice movement is predicated on, uh, the, the, the thought that they have to have control or they'll end up dead. But the, the truth is, is that until we start to nullify and get rid of these people at the state and local level from the federal government, they're, they're going to continue to foist this narrative on us that we're the oppressors, that we're the people that are oppressing our peers and people from down the street and the people in the big cities. They're going to continue to use the corporate news media to paint this picture no matter what we do. So we need to wake America up to the fact that we aren't the enemy. You know, the, the, at the end of the day, it's the ruling class that's foisting all of this stuff on us because they hate us. And if we don't do that, then this fight is just going to continue on while they continue to rob us blind and, and inflate our money and ruin our cities. And, and it, it will happen ad nauseum. So, you know, I, I try to, I try to get through to these people, but a lot of the people on the left are unreachable. Unfortunately, thankfully, most of them live in the big cities where it's already kind of lost and gone. Um, I, you know, my, my biggest, my biggest, uh, suggestion to people is to get out of the big cities. If you want to get away from this stuff, it's, it's doesn't live in the rural areas at all. So thanks. Mr. Rechtenwald, what do Americans need to know about social justice, Black Lives Matter, and feminism? Oh, okay, great. So I've um, written th three books on this topic, so I should know something. Um, it might surprise some, but I actually think uh, there is real oppression, and there is a real oppressor, and there's a real oppressed. Only the repressor, the oppressor is the state and its beneficiaries. Uh, not some white, uh, heterosexual, cis-hetero cis, cis men uh, or, uh, you know, or w white men in general or something like that. What we have is uh, the state and its beneficiaries on the one hand and everybody else on the other. It's the everybody else who is oppressed. So it's not a matter of white versus black or straight versus trans, et cetera, et cetera. It's a matter of the state versus us. And so the regime, but the regime also weaponizes minorities on purpose to attack the majority, which they deem to be their enemy. That's why they use this diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff, the DEI stuff, because what is it? It's a way of buying the uh, fealty and the loyalty of this contingent and then using them as weapons against the middle class majority that they want to destroy. For some reason, they think the middle class majority represents their biggest enemy, their biggest potential enemy in any way. So this is a divide and conquer scheme on the one hand, but there's more to it because the state actually takes one of the sides in the battle. They take the side of these so-called beleaguered minorities and they fight for them or they uh, weaponize uh, minorities against uh, the majority. So. The point is to keep our eyes off the ma uh, off the nefarious machinations of the state itself. That's really what they're up to. And uh, DEI measures are also, they're unconstitutional because they're based on discrimination. Uh, it's hiring people based on identity rather than qualifications. This is clearly discriminatory. And it, it puts people in pop play in, in places that are not competent to do certain jobs, not because of their race, but because of their qualifications. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, according to research by uh, Corey DeAngelis, the adjusted inflation increase in per student spending for schools has increased 280 percent since 1960. Mr. Smith, what do people need to know about how to improve schools and uh, have an educated populace? I think I think every libertarian is going to have the right answer to this. I would hope so. But, but the truth of the matter is that we have got, and it's going to be the same answer I've been given. It's really my answer for most of this stuff. We have got to go in and take our local uh, 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 political offices. We've got to get our local guns. We've got to get a hold of our, our, our uh, counties and municipalities and our states. Because at the end of the day, we could tell the Department of Education to get lost entirely. And states can do whatever they want. So, you know, we, we've got to, the, the, the Department of Education has got to be abolished, but, it, you know, I, I have no faith that that's going to happen from the current crop of federal politicians, and I have no faith that a libertarian is going to be the president in this year. Um, so the, the most important thing that you can do right now is to lobby at your state house, uh, get into these positions in your state house, get into these positions in your local school board, get, be, become the, the local sheriff, you know, run for these positions. Um, because that's what I hope to, to try and wake people up to do with this presidential candidacy um, is to run for these positions because you can nullify all of this stuff. You can get rid of all of this stuff at that level. And there's, the, there's nothing the federal government can do. I mean, you could become the local sheriff and arrest federal agents who show up in your town. You know, it's, 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 it all comes down to are we willing to tell the people who hate us at the top, you're no longer allowed to come to my county and do these things. So um, we've got to get rid of the, the, the Department of Education, but, but sans that, uh, you know, we got to take these positions over locally. It's much easier to get get in there in those positions, much easier. We don't have a whole the whole weight of the federal government fighting us to take our school board over. Um, and we can we can make those changes from that that point. I, I'm very lucky to live in the state of Iowa where we have full school choice. We don't even have to tell the government we're homeschooling or any of that stuff. Every state should have that opportunity. And the only way you're going to get it is by nullifying all the bad laws from the federal government at the local and state level and taking over those positions and changing it. Mr. Rechtenwald, what do the American people need to know about uh, the true solution to educational reform? Uh, well, that's a great question. It should be uh, right in my wheelhouse, too, uh, having been a professor for 25 years. And, um, you know, um, pretty much have we analyzed this. What, well, let's talk about the cost of education, the inflation of the education uh, bill, the tuition inflation. This is all due to the fact that the federal government has injected massive cash infusions into the into the schools, uh, both directly through grants to various research uh, elements, but also through student loans and grants. They have inflated the cost of tuition thanks to that. Another thing that's gone on in, within higher education, I know this intimately, is there's this burgeoning uh, administrative class, which has ballooned over the last, since 1990, it's, uh, I think it's doubled. And uh, now the administrators now outnumber faculty and universities, for example. And sometimes they even outnumber students. Sometimes they have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, ratio between students and administrators. So everybody gets their own administrator to walk around with them all day. Uh, they shadow them. So in any way, the, the the reason we have this kind of administrative bloat and other issues like that is the federal government's infusion of money into these schools, allowing them to grow this cancerous uh, administration class and completely destroying the, uh, the educational experience because they have turned it into a police state. As I talked about in my book, Springtime for Snowflakes, they've turned to the university system. They have these Stasi state like uh, apparatuses called uh, bias reporting hotlines in ca on campuses, turning students into a spies against each other. So what we need to do is get the state out of government, out of these uh, universities, uh, get state funding cut, Ten get rid of federal loans and grants. Mr. Smith, if you had the opportunity to speak to Joe Biden supporters, what would you tell them if you had two minutes of their attention? Oh, geez. Are Joe Biden supporters reachable from libertarian point of view? I don't know. I, I would like to I, I think I'd like to go back to this class consciousness 
uh, uh, argument. You know, I think that the the left and even the progressives to some point are really in tune with this class consciousness and this class analysis and, you know, making up all these different classes around the, around the, the country. And I, I just really want the opportunity to let them know that, you know, the, the class that they support politically is the only other class besides them. And that's the class that's, that's, uh, you know, robbing them blind and, and, getting devaluing their dollar and making them make a bunch of malinvestments and continues to use their money for pet projects around the world, including warfare that kills thousands, millions of people in the 20th century. Um, and you know, so, so being able to sit down with Joe Biden supporters, it's a hard, it's a hard sell, but I think that, you know, if we had the opportunity, we need to let them know that, you know, there's the oppressor class. That's the ruling, that's the ruling elite. It's not your neighbor rich down the street that has a little bit more money than you. Um, and you're the only other class in America. And, and they're going to use every tactic they possibly can to continue to uh, railroad you, steal from you and make you sick. And so um, that that's probably what I would the, the, the avenue I would take if I got to sit down with Joe Biden supporters, but most of the time they don't really like to talk to me. I do like, I, one more thing too, before I end this, um, there is a, uh, there's something that I like to do when I talk to them, but instead of using the term free market, which always shuts down the uh, conversation almost immediately, I like to, to use consumer driven market. It makes a lot more sense to them. It doesn't shut down the, the debate right away. Um, and it gives me the opportunity to talk about some of these monetary issues that they're, they're feeling in the federal reserve too, which is really important. So, uh, those are the avenues that I would take for the Biden supporters for sure. Mr. Rechtenwald, you have the attention of Biden supporters for two minutes. What do you tell them? Oh, they they have two minute they have a, an attention span of two minutes uh, I didn't know that so let's go to the point uh, I would tell them that look um, what they're railing against are a bunch of false uh, opposi false opposition uh, controlled opposition if you will they are uh, suggesting that you know uh, the uh, that the oppressors or the white straight white males that you know we're dealing with. Uh, I think there are all a lot of unconscious Marxists amongst these people. They don't really know that they're Marxists, but they've absorbed it through osmosis. So they they buy into the labor theory of value and the idea of exploitation. Uh, they buy into the idea of, uh, you know, that the wealth is expropriated from the worker at the point of production without really knowing all this language. They This is what they assume is taking place. So what I would tell them that the real enemy that they deal with is the state. It's the only entity that it can extort money from people without an agreement or contract. It, it expropriates wealth against people's wills and by force or the threat of force. It's a monopoly over force and violence. So we're looking at getting people to really see what's going on. And then, of course, you show them the fact that their whole policies are disastrous. For example, we have had record uh, inflation. We've had uh, terrible uh, issues in terms of the supply chains, and uh, uh, you know, um, you know, look at the the rate of poverty and, uh, and homelessness. It has increased every time they throw social welfare at something. They make it worse, and this is being writ large now in the United States. So everything that done it has failed. I could go, I, you know, if I had a laundry list, I could put that together and talk okay. about all the failures, but it's uh, quite considerable. Thank you. Mr. Smith, if you had the attention of Trump supporters for two minutes, what would you tell them? Well, yeah, I'd be saying all the same things I'm saying now. They're very, very, very concerned with this populist message of the deep state, the regime, all the same things that I'm concerned with. Um, I think they also have some different uh, uh, views on outcomes. They think that it's going to take some strong man to come up and and take over the whole federal government and 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 put the corporate news media in their place and all these things. And I, I've had really good success with Trump supporters by just explaining nullification and secession. Uh, in a way that they can understand. Um, and, and that's really what, it, what it's taken for me to talk to these people. And so what I, what I like to say is all this bad stuff that you're talking about, you got to understand, first of all, the cities are, are over. They're done. They're not coming back. Uh, most of us are not going to be able to retire with social security benefits in my generation. It's, it's a, it's a pipe dream. Get over it now, but we do have the opportunity to change those things for our kids. And, and the way that we do that is by a, not making bad investments, B leaving the big cities 
and see nullification, nullification, nullification. We have got to take over these localities and start telling the federal government we will no longer go along with their dictates. And I've had a lot of a lot of success with with Trump supporters like this because they're they're really upset with the federal government, the deep state, the regime, the oppressive class, even though they don't maybe know what it is in the administrative state. They may not know what this stuff is, uh, but they're mad at it. They feel it in their pockets. They're tired of being called bigots and sexists and homophobes and racists and all these words, all these, these wonderful buzzwords that they get thrown at them all the time. The best way to get rid of that stuff is to start taking over your localities and, and telling the federal government to buzz off. And I think we can do that. And I think, I honestly think that's a, a, a an accomplishable goal that they believe is also accomplishable once you explain to them how easy it is to become the county okay. sheriff. So, um, that's, that's what I would, that's the, the avenue I would take with them and do take with them. And it's been very, very successful. I have several people that have switched over from the, the Trump campaign to come and work on my campaign. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Mr. Rechtenwald, you have, uh, Trump supporters attention for two minutes. What do you say to him? Uh, I would say, first of all, I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged by the fact that there's a huge contingent of people, and many of them Trump supporters, who are utterly disaffected with the regime, the establishment. They hate it. They find it to be repulsive and completely elitist and oppressive, and they're right. Uh, they have a lot of the symptoms correct. They understand the symptoms. They just don't get the causes, and I would point that out to them. They don't see the causes as top-down government. They think that Trump can come in and as a top a top down uh, revolutionary or whatever, just overtake all of these agencies and take over and flush them out and fill it up with good people. They don't realize that it's what we need is a bottom up revolution that starts from the ground up. And I've written about this and it's uh, I wrote I spoke about it at the Mises Institute last weekend. I would say that what we're looking at is uh, getting to these people and showing them the real source of the problem and pointing to the solutions. I think decentralization and nullification and building local communities, parallel economic orders, parallel social orders, parallel uh, educational orders, parallel currency, and uh, just a parallel structure in society altogether. They, but there's, there are dangers involved with localism that have to be looked into. And that is the fact that even local governments have been infiltrated by uh, globalist interests. They have infiltrated them and they are attempting to implement uh, Agenda 2030 objectives. Uh, this has been going on. I, I mean, I'm, I've witnessed it and uh, we need to uh, be very cognizant of the kinds of infiltration that's going on in, uh, in local government. It needs to be thwarted. And we need to get libertarians in there uh, who understand the dangers okay. of control. Thank you. One of the great contradictions that Democrats and Republicans believe in is they say monopolies are terrible. We get higher prices and lower quality than we otherwise would. And also the state should monopolize policing, schooling, the currency, <laughs> the state should monopolize health care. And then they list all these things when it comes to the monopoly of security in the face of all of the riots that we've seen, especially in 2020, people go from living in a state of mind where they think, you know, my house is more or less secure to living in total insecurity. Businesses that have taken decades to build are trashed in uh, the matter of a, uh, a few hours. Mr. Smith, what can Americans do to increase the amount of security privatization in hopes of increasing the quality of security of their private property? Well, I think at this point, it's it's a safe bet that you should hire some private security. There's no doubt about it. If you if you're in. First of all, you got to leave the city. Like I said, like I said several times, the cities, it's over. The cities are are completely taken over uh by by these these heathens that are uh uh agent of the state and their uh hate for us at this point. You're you're never it's gonna be very hard in most cities around the country for you to succeed as a business in those cities now. Um, you know, the it, it's becoming barbaric at this point around, around the country in these, in these cities. And it's, it's pushed on them, uh, with, with all the, the local governments. So my first, my first suggestion was move your business out of the big cities. Cause this is where these things are happening. I left, uh, Oakland in 2020, right at the, right at the very beginning of the, of the pandemic and all this COVID stuff. Uh, I came to Iowa and you know what, none of this stuff is happening in Iowa, none of it. Uh, but I also think that, you know, getting back to the nullification narrative and getting into some of these positions statewide, 
Um, you had the opportunity to nullify federal gun laws, which is really important. I think that people should be able to carry whatever weapon they think they need to have to secure their property uh, and their and their lives. Um, and you're going to be able to do that by by getting to places like New Hampshire, where they've now put forth bills to nullify all federal gun laws in in the in the state. Um, but it's you know if you're going to operate a business, you have to have your own risk reward uh, calculations. And if you're going to open a business in one of these places in this in a big city like Oakland or San Francisco or LA or or uh, New York City, you need to be ready for these things. And you're going to have to have your own private security because the cops just don't care anymore. They just, they, they, they're done. They have state governments that are telling them they can't do the jobs they need to do. uh, And they're enforcing all of the the worst stuff, all of this terrible socialist policy um, and and globalist policy as as Dr. Michael said. Um, And so your your best bet is to leave the city. If you can't, you're going to have to hire some private security. Please start getting into your local and federal and, and state governments and nullifying all of these terrible laws that are making your life and your business life harder. Mr. Rechtenwald, what do Americans need to know about privatizing uh, security? Well, they need to understand that uh, that we we need to uh, get rid of the monopoly on force and protection in this country and around the world. This is just an outrage. They 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 are against monopolies, as you put it. It's a contradiction. They're against corporate monopolies, and you know which are very rare, but they're against them. Uh, and uh, but they're not against the state having monopolies over anything. In fact, they would like the state to have a complete monopoly over all production, i.e., socialism. So that that's curious. And they don't recognize the uh, that the fact that socialism is nothing if not a monopoly scheme. But that being that 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 aside for a second, look, the closer we get to local government, uh, the the closer we get to privatization of uh, security and defense. And so. We must get more local vesting power in local resources and getting control of the police department, the sheriff's office, uh, and all the political organs, uh, and of course the school the school system as well. The more local you go, you're almost to the point of privatization. Get more local, and then you see that look. Hey, this public space here between my house and this other house, really, we're both paying like for it in some share, so it's private. Then we could maybe split it up at some point. Once we get local, it all comes crystal clear how private property rights and uh, and not having so-called public property, uh, it becomes very clear how this is possible and uh, and, and really uh, quite logical and necessary. Uh, So privatization comes from localization first, and I think that's how we have to approach it. Mr. Rechtenwald, what do Americans need to know about social media censorship? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, being having been can- uh, canceled off of Twitter for uh, my anti-PC NYU prof, later anti-woke PC, or anti-woke prof uh, account, just for saying some things about uh, the uh, neo-Malthusianism of the uh, transgender uh, movement. Let me just say this. What we ha- I've said this in my book, Google Archipelago, way back in 2018, that these are not private entities. They are corporate uh, uh, apparatus. They are corporate extensions of the state. They are state apparatuses, and I call them governmentalities. They are not private industries at all. So what they're doing is, and we saw, of course, with the Twitter files, and I knew about this anyway, but Biden versus Missouri as well, that there's huge collusion and a pipeline between big tech and major uh, alphabet agencies in the state. And they use these pipelines to not only censor us, but to, to uh, pump in propaganda on a regular basis. So these, these organizations, big tech, which I've called the Google archipelago, uh, after, the Google, after the Gulag archipelago, that is, they're effectively prison systems in a way they disappear dissidents, they throw out, uh, they, they disappear information, they control the narrative, uh, they censor and they surveil upon you. All of this is going on with big tech that's a surveillance network as well. We need to get, uh, first of all, uh, Google also was initially funded by Incutel, the CIA's funding app, uh, arm. So we need to get, <laughs> get out of, get the state out of these organizations, quit propping them up, Ten. Uh, Quit giving them uh, uh, startup funding and 
uh, really make them private and get them out of the business of governmentality. Thank you. Mr. Smith, what do Americans need to know about social media censorship? Well, first of all, they need to know that it, when the owners of these things can be dragged into congressional hearings uh, and then and then uh, questioned about the uh, privacy and why they would keep you know conf- uh, conversations between private citizens private from the federal government, they're no longer a private entity. They are no longer a, a, a private enterprise. They are an arm of the government collecting your data and giving your data to the government. Um, Further than that, I mean, we're talking about government grants, government subsidies. This is tax money from American people uh, that help prop these these companies up. Um, and, you know, they're not private companies anymore. I think that the American public should have the, the right to sue these companies for uh, First Amendment violations. Absolutely. One hundred percent. I think that, you know, as long as the, the government continues to meddle in these private institutions and and spy uh, on private individuals through them, um, and, and, and continue to give them, uh, taxpayer money that they should be held to the same constitutional standards as everybody else is supposed to be held to, um, until they become an actual private entity that does not work with the federal government whatsoever, uh, then they, they should be, uh, held accountable. So, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to get through to the, the woke uh, cancel culture crowd with this to make them understand that, you know, it's not just a private business. And there's a lot of libertarians that fall victim to this as well. Um, it's it's really a lot of these these platforms have become a tool to uh, collect your data for the for the, you know, the bureaucracies and the agencies of the federal government. It's a really terrible thing uh, because it has become our public square. It has become the way that we communicate with the world. It, you know, a lot of people communicate with their families. I lost my Facebook uh, it, during the COVID uh, era, and I had pictures of my grandfather who passed away six years ago on there yeah. that I'll, ne- I'll never get back. Uh, I got taken off Twitter for questioning the, the, the official narrative. That's you know, that's collusion and it needs to be shut down right away. Uh, or we need to start building our own state level communication apparatus. So, so I am aware that there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs, but when people are curious about a solution or a best approach to poverty and homelessness, what do you tell them? Starting with Mr. Rechtenwald, two minutes, solution to poverty and homelessness. The solution, the, the solution to poverty and homelessness is actually, uh, is actually uh, unfettered uh, production and tr- and trade and exchange between individuals. So social welfare, as I've said a couple times, that is uh, welfare uh, and uh, other programs, they increase that which they attempt to uh, address. They actually produce more misery than they ever ameliorate, and that's been their function. Yeah, we saw it w- from the 1960s on. Before the 1960s, Black America, for, for example, had much better situation in terms of uh, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, job rates, uh, et cetera. Once the Great Society was put in place by LBJ, we saw a continual slide into poverty and dependence. And that's exactly where they want these people. They want them dependent and in, uh, under control as waifs of the state. Uh, utterly uh, unable, they've been basically disabled by the state's uh, so-called uh, munificence, and uh, and and they've been ingratiated to the state so that they'll never uh, do anything but vote for these statists and social welfare uh, advocates. I would tell them poverty is not ameliorated by 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 cutting up the pie and passing it out to more people. The co- the economy is not a pie that you can cut up and pass around. The economy is an oven for baking pies. Get that through your head. So you don't dismantle the capital that's required to produce wealth. You you can't treat the economy like a pie, and therefore everybody gets a cut and everything's fine. There's not, but there's nothing left after you, once you do that. There's no productive capacity left. You can't destroy capital that way. Thank you, Mr. Smith. What is the best approach? What do Americans need to know about the solution to poverty and homelessness? Sure. So there's uh, several. I mean, there's so many variables to poverty and homelessness in America. But I will I will start off with some that are directly from my platform. Um, the the biggest the biggest uh, the climb in in homelessness in America came uh, over the the ten years after to ten to fifteen years after Gerald Ford side signed a uh, uh, Title Four D into the uh, Social Security of the Social Security Act into law. Um, essentially gave the states an incentive 
to break apart families. Um, there's something like an godly amount. It's undeniable stats. Like 83% of all homeless and runaway youth are from fatherless homes. I mean, this is really the heart of the problem, right? When we have pe people that are homeless on the street, they don't have a family or their family is distant or they, they've had to run away from the family because their family is split up and doesn't really care. And so we've got to get rid of Title 40 of the Social Security Act. I think that it's been one of the absolute worst things for not just the family, but for youth in general. Um, it, it gives people this broke, destitute, uh, I have to split all my time between families. My father's a visitor in my life, uh, a lifestyle, and it really ruins everybody. Uh, another thing, too, is there's so many, there's, you know, we, we constantly get this pushback from the left when we talk about charity, right? And how important charity is. And, and well, if people aren't actually that, that into charity, they don't actually want to help people. That's untrue. Uh, like 85% of new charities are regulated out of the market in their first year by bureaucratic red tape and regulation. Okay. Um, there's so many people that want to help homeless out there. And we have people that are getting fined for trying to feed the homeless on streets of North Carolina. Okay. This, this is, this is, a uh, something that's gotta be stopped and can be stopped at the local level which I think is really important and, and the state level uh, by getting into those positions and nullifying these terrible regulations that make it so you can't go out and feed the homeless or you can't uh, help house the homeless. You can't help cl clothe the homeless. There are people out there that legitimately need help. Um, and the only way we're going to accomplish that is by getting rid yeah. of all these, these, uh, these regulations on them. So uh, we got to bring the family unit back. The family structure is the strongest structure in any individual's life. Uh, and we've got to get rid of the regulation that keeps charity from uh, enacting uh, help for these people. Mr. Rechtenwald, two minutes and 10 seconds. How do we promote a culture of meritocracy, private property, consent, social cooperation, and family values without getting hold of the state assuming that the next president is not going to be a libertarian. What can we do in our own personal lives to promote the society that we want to live in? Yeah, we have to do this uh, by virtue of our own activity. So we have to practice the free market in our own lives. Uh, we need to uh, divest from uh, particular uh, types of investments like ESG. Uh, we need to pull out of, uh, you know, we need to have a parallel currencies in place in case the CBDC is put into play. Uh, we need um, to create the kind of worlds that we need. We need we, we have to be a remnant at the very least, a remnant that passes a legacy on to the future of individual liberty and uh, the, the ownership and, of one's own property and rights to exchange property. This is our this is the least we can do for posterity. If we do nothing more, we'll have done something, but it may not. It's, it's not the most we can do. The most we can do is actually build communities on a local basis that control their own destinies, uh, vest pe power in the people at the local level, uh, and create the kind of economies that we would like to see proliferate on a larger scale. Thank you. Mr. Smith, what can we as individuals do to promote a culture of meritocracy, private property, consent, social cooperation, and family values? Sure. So I once had a uh, great Patrick Smith from Disenthrall Media on my show, and I, I asked him a question similar to this, you know, as an anarchist, as somebody who absolutely refuses to work in politics or the state, what do you think is the best way that you can enrich, uh, you know, the, the, the world that you live in? And he says, well, it starts with yourself, right? It's always going to start with yourself because when you do the right things and people see you, they want to do the right things too. When they see the, the, these, uh, these great investments that you make or how well you take care of your home or any of these, any of these good things, how, how good of a parent you are, the people want to be like you. So the first thing we need to do is set an example as human beings, right? Because when you do well in your own home, your, your community does well, when your community does well, it starts to take hold in your, in your County. It starts to take hold in your state. And we see this a lot in these States that are more prosperous than some of the other States like California. Right. Um, and so that's very, very important. And I want to, and I also want to preface this with, you know, this is about uh, work, but um, during the COVID stuff, we had this, this, uh, mandate come down that said, Hey, by December 10th, if you haven't taken the vaccine, you're going to be, uh, walked out of the building. It'll be your last day, December 10th. And, um, I wasn't going to take the thing and I, my family wasn't going to take the thing. I wasn't going to give it to my, my children. So I went around to the coworkers that I have and said, Hey, I don't want to take this thing. And they, and they were like, well, we don't want to take it either, but we don't want to lose our jobs. I said, well, why don't we all go to the boss together and tell them that it on December 10th, will be our last day, everybody. They can't operate without us. This, this, We're a very important factor of this job. 
So we did that. And on December 8th, they told us the mandate was dropped and none of us had to get COVID, the COVID vaccine. Now, this is just a, a small piece of what we can do on the local and state level, but we've got to go out and educate people. And that's what I hope to use this presidential campaign for yeah. is to do the same thing that I did at my job for the COVID vaccine around the, around the entire country and, and let people know that there is a better way and we don't have to listen to these federal government dictates by just uh, changing ourselves, changing our communities and changing our, our localities. Thanks. One of the things that a lot of LP members are looking for is someone who can take the ideas that really motivated us to become libertarians and communicate them to the masses. Starting with Mr. Rechtenwald, give me an example of something you learned from Murray and Rothbard and how you would communicate it to the average voter. Okay, that's great. Um, so, you know, uh, Murray Rothbard's written an amazing books. So I'd say my, uh, my favorite, all-time favorite is Anatomy of the State. And um, I'd learned so, so much from that book and what I would uh, teach. The, I think I've already talked about what I would teach to the uh, to the uh, American public about that book. And that who is who is who is aligned against us, who is, in fact, the, the expropriator of wealth, who is, in fact, the one who exploits people. Uh, it's none other than the state and its beneficiaries. It is not some capitalist class. It is not. Uh, something like, uh, you know, they're not the ruling class. The ruling class is actually the, the, the class that can force you to give them money uh, with, you know, at the, at the point of a gun, at the end of a gun. I mean, that's what we're dealing with with the state. And Rothbard taught me that through that book. Uh, read it, you know, five, six years ago. Read it again recently. It's an excellent uh, little treatise. And uh, I think it's actually uh, one that's utterly essential to understanding uh, modern life uh, and the state itself. Um, I've given uh, uh, I've given lectures, plenty of lectures across the country, in which I talk about the state and the lessons that I've learned through libertarianism. I'm able to communicate that. A lot of times, it comes through other topics like globalism or like the Great Reset. But I'm able to get the points across through vis-a-vis -vis those topics. And I've been pitching, uh, you know, libertarian ideas through my work uh, for uh, many years and five books and hundreds of essays and dozens and dozens and dozens of Ten. podcasts. So thank you. Mr. Smith, what is an example of the most important thing you learned from Murray Rothbard and how would you communicate it to Americans? Well, I think the most important thing that I that I personally learned from Murray is is uh, you know the, the 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 federal government doesn't actually control me. They only control what they can convince the population that they control. Um, and I think I've done really well at you know kind of taking the ideas that I've learned from this great literature. You know, for a new liberty was the first libertarian book I ever re at read. Actually, if you can believe it, it was a it was a a huge jump start into this this philosophy and this movement. But um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm a blue collar working class guy who spent my entire life thinking that the federal government has the authority and the right to, to dictate what every state does, what every individual does. They have the right to put you in jail. They have the right to, uh, you know, uh, extract your, your wealth. They have the right to do all these things. And, and Murray is the one that taught me that the, the government doesn't have that opportunity, that the, the authority to do those things. And, um, I've had, I've had a lot of success with the blue class or with the blue collar working class. And that's who I am. That's who I speak to. Those are the the biggest the biggest block of voting uh, people in the in the United States. Those are the people who are hurting the most from government policy. Um, they're the people who are, are constantly being told they have to put their their kids in government schools. So I've had a real good opportunity uh, opportunity to translate the thing those things that I've learned about the authority, the actual authority of the federal government uh, to the blue collar working class. And, 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 you know, I've got a lot of people to, to check out and opt out and say, we're not going to do this anymore. Whether they've joined the libertarian party, whether they become an anarchist, full-blown anarcho-capitalist. Uh, I've turned a lot of people over my, you know, uh, 15 years of doing this stuff. So, uh, Murray is a great groundbreaker for a lot of people, but he can be a little hard to read for people who have never been into libertarian philosophy before. Uh, not, maybe not as hard as human action by Mises, but pretty hard. So, um, it, it is good to be able to translate those things to, to the working class who's never actually read any libertarian philosophy. It's very, very important that we do it in that way and don't just hit them with books right off the bat. <laughs> so, 
Mr. Rechtenwald, what is the most important thing you learned while being a professor? Yeah, one of the things I've learned by being a professor, one of the most important things is to understand where people are based on, you know, to, to get into their mindset and understand where you're trying to get them from. You have to understand where they are to understand getting to them to another point, like allowing them to reach a certain uh, uh, destination requires you to understand their actual location. So, I mean, I've spent, you know, listen, I also, I hail from the working class. It's not like um, I'm some Ivy League school kid. I came from the lower north side of Pittsburgh. My family were in construction. So I knew what the difference was between what the uh, the educated were saying as compared to the working class. And so I I understood how to reach out to and make sense of things for working class people because I came from there. And I don't like the idea that I'm somehow, because I accomplished something and uh, was able to get highly educated, that that's somehow a, a, a disqualification. That's utterly ridiculous. In fact, I have, through my efforts, uh, undertaken, have a great deal of accomplishments that have a lot to do with hard work that came from the very principles uh, uh, that I learned in, in my family, a working class ethic, work ethic. So... Uh, I think knowing where people are coming from and being able to reach them where they are. And, you know, in, in, I think it helps a little bit not to be the absolute smartest person on earth, because if you are, you don't understand people's difficulties with grasping things. And I do understand people's difficulty with grasping ideas and therefore I'm able to reach them. Thank you. Mr. Smith, what is the most important uh, lesson you learned uh, while being in the military? Oh man, uh, the, the military industrial complex does not care one bit about the American people. It's, uh, you know, or, or any people, any human life for that matter. And, and I, I was talking to you about this before the show, but, uh, I was attached to USS constellation during operation Iraqi freedom. Uh, we were the biggest part of the shock and awe campaign. In fact, our, our, uh, specific battle group dropped a hundred million tons of ordnance on Baghdad. And, uh, I learned that, you know, innocent human life doesn't mean much when uh, resources and 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 capital are on the line for the federal government and its its cronies. Um, and that's really what brought me here. That's why I'm here today. Uh, it, it taught me that the, these people are evil. They hate us. Uh, they want us dead or completely submitted. Um, they want full control over every life they possibly can. They want full control over every resource they can find. Um, and the only way we're ever going to get away from them is to secede, to, to tell them they don't have the authority over us anymore. And, and that's really what the military taught me. Um, and it's taught thousands and thousands and thousands of other vets the same lesson. Um, and that's why I think that vets are so good for this movement. I know a lot of my, my friends in the libertarian movement have bad things to say about vets. And yeah, there is some atonement that needs to be made uh, from veterans. But nobody understands the state and their evils around the world better than a veteran who's had to take part in that stuff for, uh, you know, predicated on lies and rosy pronouncements. So um, I've learned that the government lies to us. They hate us. They will kill you uh, if they want something from you and you're not giving it up. Uh, and they will do anything they possibly can to foist their pet projects and, and uh, rule on the world. Thank you guys so much for your time. We have two more eight uh, minute segments here, starting with Mr. Rechtenwald. Please ask uh, Josh Smith any set of questions you'd like. I am going to give you eight minutes. You guys can sort of have the floor. This first eight minutes is going to be led by Dr. Rechtenwald, and then we will uh, switch it up where Josh can lead the conversation. Mr. Rechtenwald, uh, what's your question for Josh? Eight minutes. Oh, I, I, I would think I have uh, several. I would ask, um, first of all, um, Josh, the... Um, uh, the kinds of vituperation and abuse and uh, vitriol that's been aimed at me by your supporters, I just wonder if you avow this kind of behavior because it's you know, libelous in many cases and also extremely uh, counterproductive. I'm trying to fight the regime, not you. Uh, I have, I'm trying to get at what's ailing this world, this country, and uh, this society. I think we're under societal decadence. We're under social disillusion and tyranny at the same time so what i'm trying to do is wreck the regime not wreck josh smith 
And I just wonder whether you sanction this kind of behavior or unaware of it or if it's something that uh, is completely out of your can. I mean, I'm not blaming you. I'm, I'm just saying that uh, I have to say that I'm almost as surprised as I, I'm a bit surprised because it's kind of uh, vituperation and abuse and kind of uh, libel and so forth that I've seen. It's very similar to the leftism that I, uh, the, the leftists that came after me back in 2016. I mean, I'm not, I'm nonplussed by it. It's not rattling me, but it's disturbing. Sure. That's the first question. Well, I'll tell you this much. Uh, welcome to the Libertarian Party. I've been dealing with the same, <laughs> the same thing for about seven years now, uh, including having my family dragged, my my uh, my 15 year old at the time daughter uh, groomed by a mm. group of libertarians to say bad mm. things about me for money and, and a phone mm. when she was in a really bad situation. This is this is politics. It's ugly. It's a dirty, terrible game. I do not sanction libel. I do not think that making up lies about you is a good thing, whether it's my supporters or not. Mm. Um, I will say that I have people that are my supporters that feel slighted by some of your supporters as well. Um, and that have, have, uh, said some, some pretty mean things to them just for asking questions. I think you came into the race, uh, uh, kind of at a, in a bad way, uh, by saying that you were the only candidate who was trying to get people to join the libertarian party when I had been the number one recruiter in the entire libertarian party for like two years straight at one point. Um, and, and we definitely are getting people signed up to be delegates and stake, uh, state members and and federal or uh, national members. So I think people were felt a little slighted when you came in and, and started kind of taking those jabs saying I didn't have an email list when we have a 50 million pe people's data right now um, and saying that we didn't have millionaires when we had millionaires. So I think there was, I think there was some, uh, uh, you know, kind of slight that they felt because they've been working on the campaign for a couple months or trying to help the campaign be bolstered for a couple months. And here comes the new guy that's with the caucus that I helped build um, at, since 2016. And uh, and he's got some some choice things to say about me. Now, when I ask you questions personally on online, I'm serious. I really want those answers. Like I want to know about the the Hillary Clinton donations and the Trump donations and when red donations because I think that's an important part of this stuff, right? You want to mm -hmm. lead you want to lead my the party that I've tried to help bolster and build for the last you know, six or seven or eight years. Um, and I think those are important things like when red you're, you're donating to win red, who has fought to keep us off the ballot as candidates around the country for many, many, many years. Well, not well since 2020, at least since when red came around. So those kind of things are important to me as a candidate, because I need to know how we, how we can maybe atone for those things, but also how you're going to keep a clear unbiased head when you're running as a president and you won't do something. We've had people like in the past, like Bill Weld, who, uh, got up on the on the major stage after coming right over from the Republicans and and endorsed Hillary Clinton and a little bit of gun control and had worked for you know the uh, the CFA and some of these other organizations that keep us in per perpetually in war around the, the world and so I think that you know there is some some anger there from some of these people that have been my supporters and been with me through all this stuff for a long long time but no I don't at all I, I definitely disavow any kind of liable I don't want any lies being made about you um, I think that uh, that uh, you know valid criticism and honest and honest questions are very, very important. This race, I'm going to have to answer them too. I have all kinds of people. So, okay. Um, I would, you know, just, you know, say a few things about what some of the things you said or claims that I think are not true. I, I never said, uh, that I was the only one, uh, that was asking people to join the libertarian party. Um, I don't think I said, uh, that, um, I was the only one who was bringing millionaires into the party. I never said that. I never said a no, lot. You said of I did, no, you said I didn't have any millionaires. I never said that. And, and I didn't have a big, I, I literally have a screenshot and I can. I never it said right that. If you'd like but, to. Okay. I think a lot of things have been, you know, unfavorably and uh, mistakenly construed, but let's, I, I, let's get that behind us. I'm not interested in, uh, in that. I'm not interested in the kind of, uh, uh, backbiting uh, ad hominem type of attacks that have been leveled at me, like uh, by legions of uh, seeming surrogates. But surrogates, but uh, you know, be that as it may. Um, uh, like I would ask you. Um, well, I, I guess what I would like to get at is, um, what's your? How's you? How are you going to reach? Uh, a mass audience outside of the narrow uh, echo chamber of the Libertarian Party. Where, where do you, how do you see yourself reaching, uh, 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 you know, non-libertarians uh, uh, by virtue of you know your platform? Where, where, where are you going to find them? How are you going to get to them? 
what evidence in the past have you had that shows that you're able to do that? Sure. Two so two minutes and uh, five seconds remaining. Okay, perfect. So uh, I I don't know if you realize this, but I did just go on Timcast. I'm the first candidate for the for the uh, LP presidential race that's been on Timcast. We're working on Sean Ryan. We're working on PBD. We're working to try and get on Rogan. We're gonna do all the same podcasts that and shows that we said we were gonna do. But also we're we're a media heavy campaign. We're building our own media. Uh, I put I've already put out two big campaign videos that have well over well over a million hits each. Um, we've we've taken our campaign from forty people in the campaign team to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people working on the campaign around the country, including delegate allocation and all these good things. So we're already doing those things, and I think that my platform is very very important to that mission we've already we've written a platform that sets us apart from the uniparty uh it, it, it makes a lot of sense to the blue collar working class people which are the people that are most disaffected by national politics um and 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 we have the opportunity to go out and spit this liberty stuff the way that it's supposed to be spat and um you know i i've been working towards these ends for for many years now in the libertarian movement i started out as a nobody that just did a publication nobody knew about it grew i, I i've grown a national platform. I have uh, over, uh, you know, over a million downloads and watches of my podcast. People know, people already know who I am. So we're going to continue to grow that, that platform, but we're going to get on the biggest shows around the country. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, at some point we'd like to end up on Tucker. We'd like to end up on some of these, these bigger, even bigger shows than, than Tim cast. But, um, for now I've done the biggest media with this campaign, uh, by just going on Timcast, as far as other candidates, I don't know what you've done yet, but as far as all the other candidates, we've already done the biggest media of all of them. And I just came in three months ago. So um, some of these guys have been campaigning since last November. Um, and so we're, we're going to reach, we're going to reach the people that we intend to reach no matter what I'm, I've been a fighter. I've been, a, I've been, a, I've gone around this country. I've been to 49 States over the last Ten. six years and shaken all the hands and talked to all the people that I need to talk to. And, and we're going to leverage those relationships into a, a 50 state media tour that reaches the middle class. Mr. Smith, please lead the discussion, starting with a question you have for Mr. Rechtenwald, eight minutes. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I also felt like I was pretty slighted. I think your um, your associate, Lori, uh, uh, Lori Price, is constantly going at my my supporters as well when they say nice things about us, uh, about me. I've also seen her in uh, the space that I did. Um, and uh, I believe maybe the debate I did with uh, on on TR on the redhead libertarian as well, but I'm not sure. Um, saying some some bad things, and you did when you popped on. You said uh, Josh Smith doesn't have an email list like I do, doesn't have millionaire donors, doesn't have all this stuff. And I think that it's really important for me to 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 make my claim here that I don't care about the donor class at all. Um, I I have millionaire. In fact, after after that that initial comment was made. Uh, we've now gotten two millionaires that have donated big sums to the campaign, um, that said that they support us. So, uh, we do have millionaires. We do have a, a large email list that we send out emails to all the time. I have lists of delegates going back six, six conventions, um, just, just inside the party. Now we have this 50 million American data dump that we're going to start polling Americans all across the country, uh, uh weekly. Um, so I, I want to know, you know, what is it that you, besides those things that you came on talking about this email list and, you know, your books and, and the, the, the couple of millionaires that you got in your back pocket, what, what are you going to do, uh, to go out and get the message out? Um, you know, and, and understanding that the Libertarian Party is its own beast. It is very, 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 very hard to make any kind of stride when you're running in the Libertarian Party. What do you, what kinds of things are you going to do to make sure that you get that message out? Well, first of all, I'm going to uh, share all the data that my campaign collects with the Libertarian Party. I'm going to knock on doors to get ballot access in at least five states. I'm going to encourage and also run with local uh, local uh, people to run for local office and support them uh, by helping them uh, on the ground. And uh, so we're building a, an infrastructure from the ground up. This isn't a top-down Michael Rechtenwald wreck the regime. This is about the, a bottom-up revolution, a decentralized revolution of wrecking the regime uh, all of this comes, of course, out of the Mises Caucus, which supports me. And all of these things are uh, are something that we're working on. We're not running on emotion. We're not trying to. Our message is not simply an, um, uh, an emotion. It's a, it's a movement and a plan. And that plan has many parts to it. And we're going to do them all. So I, I am... Uh, 
I'm uh, going to be in uh, almost every convention, and I'll be at many, in many states helping candidates on the ground and actually going around with them, getting signatures uh, to get ballot access in New York and other places. So, um, you know, I've been working uh, as a lowercase libertarian for seven, seven to eight years, and I've done a tremendous amount of work in that arena, and that slows the soil for the Libertarian Party to, to grow in. So I just want to point that out, that it's just different, and I've been in a different sphere. That doesn't mean I don't deserve something. This is not an entitlement. Uh, nobody's entitled to this uh, based on some sort of history. It, it is not entitlement. Uh, everybody must do their thing and, and the, let the best candidate win. But I don't think uh, any sort of time served or anything like that is really, uh, is really uh, either a, a predictor of what will happen, or, nor do I think it's the right measure. Oh, thanks. Thanks for your answer. I forgot that I was asking questions now. And uh, so, um, okay, perfect. So I'd, I'd also like to know, um, you know, have you ever, like, you know, we all have seen your FEC contributions now. This is something that we, you know, is being passed around on the internet. It's happened to me before. I've had all kinds of personal stuff passed around on the internet every time. This is my fourth national campaign, so in a row. Um, and so I'd like to know, you know, some of these organizations, you say you were a small L libertarian, but I'd like to know some mm -hmm. of these organizations that you were were uh, contributing to mm -hmm. were Trump PACs, uh, win red, of course, which is the answer to the the act blue of the Democrats. Um, and a lot of these PACs and, and people that you've donated to have actually actively tried to keep libertarian candidates off the ballot. So you can understand that there's some people in the libertarian party that are a little bit worried about those those contributions um, and maybe your uh you know, your your plans for your presidential run, thinking maybe that you're here to try and tank some stuff so that it makes it easier for the the Trump uh, side to not lose votes. Um, I mean, how can you prove to these people that are going to be entrusting their faith in you to go on a 50 state media tour and be as absolutely brave as you possibly can about these things? How can you how can you can quell their fears and get them to, to to trust in you? And I would like to say also that the, the caucus is absolutely split. Um, a lot of the supporters of the, of the Mises caucus are definitely still either trying to decide whether it's going to be me and you or are already on my campaign or are already on your campaign. So the, the board of the caucus supports you, but you got to remember that the, the rank and file is much bigger than the board of the caucus. So, Okay, I understand that. Um, you know, so these contributions, first of all, we're talking about $20 maybe uh, in 2022 and then $20 in 2020. Let me explain them. The, okay, so... You know, I would like to point out that, look, these weren't support of Trump. This was hatred for the, the establishment. Uh, the first donation had to do with what I thought to be uh, electoral chicanery, not because I supported Trump, but I think the regime is involved in elect electoral theft. Two minute uh, no. warning. Secondly, the other donation was when Trump was indicted. Uh, the first time. That was simply out of support and hatred for this regime. I, I've heard Clint Russell talk about the idea of possibly voting for Trump just to stick it to the regime. That's the animus behind those donations. It has nothing to do with supporting the uh, Republican Party per se. I just don't like, okay, I don't like the, the, uh, this, the regime, the establishment. And what they're after. Well, you were and, you were registered a Republican until after you announced, so that's why people were a little worried. So, no, uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I wasn't a, li a a big L libertarian until recently, until I was asked to run. But you know, I've not been some sort of a rabid Republican. I, you could look; I've never really written anything in support of Trump. The only thing I've said in support of Trump was a few times. Well, look what this regime is doing to them. It proves how totalitarian what what we're dealing with is. Sure. And that's really what sickens me. And the same goes for the January 6th protesters. These people are being treated like garbage, like worse than garbage. They're being treated like uh, we have a gulag system in this country. That's they're, what po they're political prisoners, for sure. There's exactly. No yeah. So anyway, sorry for the misunderstandings. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to actually wrecking the regime. And I don't think uh, that you're my 
uh, enemy. Okay. Sure. I don't, I don't see you as an enemy. I don't either. And I've told several people that I, you know, I'd be more than happy if, if I got the nod to have you as a vice presidential candidate as well and vice versa. So, um, I, I have no problem with what you're saying. I think the things that you're saying are great. Absolutely. 100%. I think that this, this, the whole debate and not just the debate, but this campaign is going to come okay. down to who the delegates believe are, are is going to do a better job at communicating because we don't have, we don't have difference. I mean, we sat here this through whole, this, this whole debate and said the same things in different words. So, uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I look forward to this race and I, I look forward to seeing you in DC and I, I have no animosity towards you. I just want things cleared up. That's all. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Thank you, gentlemen. Final, uh, two minute closing statement, starting with Mr. Rechtenwald. Well, thanks so much for the time and thanks for uh, the audience and for watching and listening. I just want to say that, um, you know, I'm running for president uh, to wreck the regime. But by that, I don't mean Michael Rechtenwald will step in into the highest office in the land and wreck the regime. No, I'm calling on libertarians and those who would become libertarians to run with me to wrest power from the central government and to restore it to the people at the local level. I'm not merely selling emotion or, uh, you know, a violent rhetoric. I am representing a movement and a plan. Uh, I would add that I'm not, you know, uh, certainly disabled. I'm not certainly disabled by my academic background. I'm not the first so-called intellectual who's in modern history who's sought high office, for example. Uh, one of my heroes is Vaclav Havel. He was a Czechoslovakian poet, essay, A.S. Essayist is playwright and dissident under communist rule. He resisted the Soviet regime and helped to bring it to its knees. He later became president of Czechoslovakia. So I'm, I'm running to give libertarians and then the broader American citizen your help. So the opportunity to support somebody like me, which I think I'm a thoughtful, studied, serious, and accomplished thinker. I'm not, you know, an elitist. I, I hate the elite, actually. And, but I've shown throughout my life, I have uh, shown commitment and resolve and i always do what i'm going what i say i'm going to do and you know uh, many much evidence that suggests that when i say i'm going to do something i do it i don't need you to support uh, you to support me based on an empty and unkept promises but based on a lifelong history of demonstrated resolve and accomplishment 10 and that's uh and there's there's not we have a herculean task before us so uh i ask you to Give me your support and I will support you in return. Join me to wreck the regime. It's time. Mr. Smith, two minute closing statement, please. First of all, thank you so much, Keith, for uh, holding this debate. I really appreciate you. Michael, thank you so much. I had a great time uh, hanging out with you and learning more about you. Uh, look, the, the, the revolution will not be televised uh, because people like uh, the, the regime and, and their cronies and the corporate news media and the ADL and organizations like those are going to con continually shut down our freedom of speech. They're going to make it very, very hard for us to organize with like-minded people. They're going to lie to us repeatedly and tell us over and over and over that we are the minority. I do not believe that. I believe that people like me That's and people like Keith time. and people like Michael are all over hoping that more people will step up and take and take part in these things. Um, look, the presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party is not going to win the Libertarian or is not going to win the, the general election. We have to get that out of our minds right now. At best, at best, our biggest goal is to get over 5% so we can change the national political landscape, start taking money from the state. Uh, and using it for good, start getting into the debates so we can look these competitors in the eye and tell them that they're evil and 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 tell the American pu uh, public that they hate us and that it's them versus us, um, it, you know, because it's the only way we're going to get in front of these people on a mass scale. Uh, but this this campaign is about running a 50 state media tour and waking people up to the ideas of nullification and succession. Uh, and telling people that they can get involved and take the local guns, they can get involved and take the the municipalities and the school boards and the the state houses. They can take these things. They can arrest federal agents when they come in to enforce federal laws. They can nullify, nullify, nullify all of this terrible stuff that they keep trying to foist on us. The cities are gone. Your retirement through okay. Social Security is gone. This is the only way that we're going to make headway against an absolute Leviathan. I hope you will join me. I hope you will give me the opportunity at joshuasmith2024.com to help you by doing this media tour and waking people up to these ideas. 
Follow the candidates at michaelrechtenwald.com and joshuasmith2024.com. Thanks to everyone for watching Keith Knight Don't Tread on Anyone. Mr. Rechtenwald, Mr. Smith, thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.